All right. I've been goaded up and said it's time to start. I, I must be running behind again. Just about five minutes. That ain't too bad. Amen. But uh, good to see the Lord's house tonight. Good to see this good crowd. And uh, so thankful for you coming out, being a part of this study tonight. And may God use it to, to help you. May God encourage you through it. And uh, we'll just give him the honor and praise for everything he's done. Boy, I, I just want to say this. God sure has been good to us lately. Amen. Just so thankful for his presence and for his uh, movement in our, in our services. And uh, I think you'll be very, very thankful for what all God's been doing in the coming weeks. You see, as God moves and as see things he's already done, uh, but uh, it's good to be here. We're going to be back in our study of Jude tonight. We're going to, I told you last week, I'm going to try my best to get more than one verse, and I, the, the verses we got tonight are a little shorter, so maybe I can get through two or three tonight, so uh, let's, let's see if we can do that, but before we do that, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, any special prayer requests we need to remember tonight? Remember Ken Williams dealing with cancer, and Carly Whitman's a young lady at Bowden High School. She's actually having a heart procedure done. I think she's having an ablation, uh, so very young to have that done, but heart's out of the rhythm. Pray for her. Um, also, remember all the ones that's dealing with the, the COVID. Uh, I know there's still many in our in our community that, that are dealing with it, <clears throat> in the Bowden community, in the Heard County area as well. Let's continue to pray for those those families. Um, Amen. Let's pray for that negative test for Kathy Burns. Brenda. Brenda Rogers. Not our Brenda Rogers, but uh, but another one. But we are going to pray. Let's, let's remember her, but also we are going to pray for our Brenda Rogers as well as she continues with her, working with her hand. Any others? Suzanne Horton. Okay, let's remember her. Okay. Pray for our churches in our area, all our churches. We, we need to pray for one another. We, we prayed last week uh, for our church, and but we weren't just specific specifically praying for our church but the church as a whole the, the body of believers but uh pray for our, our churches in our area I, I tell you god is doing great mighty things through all the churches in our area i get on line sometimes and get to listen to some of our our local pastors preach and uh, boy they just do an outstanding job and i'm thankful for all the good men of god that we have in our community Continue to pray for them. Pray for revival, the revival service that will be taking place in D.C. coming up in September. I think they've got all that uh, squared away. The uh, other day I saw a post where um, the evangelist said they had a meeting with the Department of the Interior. Uh, big, big meeting there to okay the site, okay the, the place, and they got it okay. So uh, it's, it's in the words, it's going to happen, so you pray for that. That revival there in Washington, D.C., pray for the, the preachers and the singers and all that will be involved with it. Pray for our country, pray for our president, pray for our leaders, local and national leaders. Pray for our schools, keep them in your prayers. You know, we've got a few schools that will be starting back uh, next week, right? About Carroll County will be starting next week, and then Carrollton will be starting back September the 8th, correct? Remember that one. Brother Dustin, Miss Anna. Any others? Amen. Continue to pray for all of Miss Nikki Etheridge. She, she's getting over it and doing well. Pray for her family if they don't contract it. <clears throat> I called Brother Jason the other day and was asking about Miss Nikki. 
And I said, uh, you know, when I heard it was Nikki that had it, I, I was concerned. But uh, I'm just thankful you didn't get it because you, you're not near as tough as she is. Amen. <laughs> and uh, he agreed with me. Amen. But uh, now I'm just, just picking. But I'm thankful for that family and thankful that the, the Lord touched. Susan Lover, uh, no, Rice, excuse me, yeah, let's remember her, she's uh, still dealing with the, the after effects of it from the pneumonia, all right, any others tonight, if not, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer at this time, I'm thankful that we have a Lord that we can come to, the Bible says we have access to the Father through the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, in, in the Old Testament times, they had to go through a mediator. They had to go through a high priest. They had to go through, uh, you know, that high priest had to offer the sacrifices. But the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, we have one mediator in between us and God, and it's Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we're thankful for that. We, don't have, we can go straight to him tonight with these requests. And the Bible says what he hears and what we bring to is his attention that he hears and he'll move according to his will in it. So we're just praying for that in faith tonight. Let's uh, bow our heads, go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Dear Lord, we come to you this day just as humbly as we know how. God, I just want to come to you, Lord, tonight with a thankful heart. God, you've been so good. Lord, your, your blessings and your, your guidance have been amazing, Lord, the last few weeks. And we're just so thankful, God, that you're moving. Lord, I want to give you the praise and the honor for it, God, the things that you've done, Lord. Some things this church doesn't even know about, God, but we know. And God, I'm so thankful for what you're doing, and how you're working, and how you're moving. And I just pray that you continue to do that, God, in our midst. God, we just pray for every request that's been answered or been mentioned tonight. Lord, you know them by heart. Lord, you know them specifically. Lord, you have the answer to every prayer request that's been answered, that's been asked tonight. Lord, you can touch and you can heal. And God, you can. You can uh, protect and all the things that we've asked you tonight. Lord, you have the ability to do it exceedingly abundantly above that we even ask or think. God, we just thank you for that tonight and ask you that you do it according to your will. Be with us in our, our guidance tonight, or guide us tonight in our study. Give us the words that we stand in need of. Lord, let it strengthen us. Let it empower us. Lord, let it grow us in spirit and in truth. That, Lord, we might be the witness. Lord, that we might be that one the that we need to be for you, God, the witness that we need to be for you in this lost and dying world. God, we pray for the lost tonight, especially, God, we pray for those that do not know you as Lord and Savior. God, we know you still have the power to save. Lord, you're still saving souls each and every day. God, we just pray for those specifically, Lord, tonight that you put upon our hearts. Lord, we pray that you give us a burden for lost people, God, Lord, that we call, uh, share the gospel, Lord, and you call them under repentance, God, before it's eternally too late. This lead God and direct us, and we ask you all these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right. Uh, the book of Jude tonight, we're going to continue on. We've made it through the first seven verses. Uh, I think it took us about seven weeks to make it through seven verses. We might have might have went a little faster than that. But tonight we're going to be looking at verse number 8, 9, and 10. We've been calling this study a fight worth fighting because the whole theme to Jude's letter is for us to contend for the faith, to contend for the faith. That means to stand up for the doctrines of our beliefs, for the, 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 the words that the Lord has given unto us. He says, know them and stand up for him. And the theme is, and what we've been trying to get through to, uh, through this study is that we have a responsibility as believers to know the truth of the word of God. And not only to know it, but be ready to give an account for it. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter number 15, or excuse me, 1 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 15 says this. It says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an account or an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. The Bible says for us to be equipped. He, God has given us the ability and the equipping to know His Word. He's given us an, a, a, an under, or He's given us a Holy Spirit to guide us. The Bible says He will guide us into all truth. You say, well, how do you understand what the Bible says? Through the Holy Ghost, amen, that He reveals it to us, He gives it to us. 
but he says we are to sanctify or set apart the Lord in our hearts and be ready always to give an answer. You know, I was thinking about this. We're going to read our scripture in just a moment. But I was thinking about this. One of the greatest failures of the church, I believe, in the last few decades has been this. Uh, there has been an eff- emphasis put on salvation. And you say, well, what? How in the world are you saying that is a failure? That's not the failure of the church. It's good for an emphasis on salvation. We need to put an emphasis on salvation. We need to share the gospel. We need to reach out to the lost. That is a responsibility. It's not just a need. It's a responsibility. But what we've done is once we've reached those people with salvation, we've turned them loose and said, see you later. Glad you got your your ticket. And we hadn't done a whole lot of discipling with them. And uh, I believe the Bible uh, teaches us that once a person is saved, then it needs to be discipled. Do you know how the, the, the disciples turned the world upside down in just a generation? It's because they, would, they worked, into the power, or worked through the power of the Holy Ghost, first and foremost. But secondly, once they had someone that was saved, they would disciple them, they would teach them, they would walk through them and make a disciple of that new convert. Then that new convert would go out and make other disciples. And those new, then they would walk beside those new converts there teach them the Word of God, teach them what the Bible teaches, the doctrines, and then that person would go out and do that. And in one generation, they would reach the world. Do you realize today that there is a a format or a plan out there called one generation to reach the world? Do you realize we could reach the world, all of us, we could reach the whole world with the gospel in just one generation? Right now, if we would take that that game plan or that blueprint, this is the blueprint. If you would... Get somebody on your heart, pray for them, share the gospel with them. Glory to the Lord that they would be saved. Then for one year, you would walk with them, discipling them, teaching them about the word of God. For one year, just one person a year. Then the next year, you do the same thing. Get somebody else, but they would also do the same, same thing. Do you realize that we could reach the whole world, the population of the world in one generation if we would do that? That's one, one of the great failings is we're not discipled. The, the, there is an ignorance of discipleship. And I think the problem with that lies in that when there's a lot of people that are very, they have a lot of questions about faith and about things of the Lord. And they'll come to people that should know those things and should be able to give an account or give an answer to the hope that we have. And they'll ask somebody and they'll say this, well, I don't really know what the Bible says about that. Let me get back to you. And they may get back. Hey, that's okay if you got to get back to somebody. I have to do that a lot. I say, listen, I'll get back to you. But we need to make sure we get back to them, right? Amen? But a lot of times we say, well, I just don't have an answer. I don't, know, I don't really know what the Bible says. But I can guarantee you this. If they go out and talk to an atheist or they go out and talk to somebody, a secularist that is against the, against the gospel, against the Bible, and they ask them why the Bible isn't true, they're full of answers, amen? They know, they'll, give, they'll share something with them and give them an answer. So us as a church, we are to defend and contend for the faith, but to do that, it's going to be through a knowledge of the Bible. That's why we are here tonight. Listen, that's why you're here tonight. I, want to, I just want to commend you tonight. Thank you for being here. Now, this group right here is here. Every time we have the church doors open, you're here. And I know there's some that are watching online faithfully that watch each and every week and just not able to come out and be a part of us our live services, but I want to say I commend all of you that are, that are making a, a, an effort to learn, to know what the Bible says. You say, well, Brother Kevin, why in the world are we in the book of Jude? It's really confusing. It's really deep. It's really hard. Well, because we gotta, if we're going to train and be tough in our faith, we've got to train tough. Amen? When, when you go out and you decide you're going to run a marathon, what do you have to do? You've got to train. You better train, amen. You'll get not very far down that, that road and you'll pass out and they'll have to come get you with a stretcher. But you have to train. But listen, you have to train hard. There's a lot of difference in training for a marathon and training for a one-mile run. Would you agree? You can go out and just jog a little bit, get, get your heart rate up, get your cardio working. You go run a mile pretty easy with no trouble. But you've got to train hard for a marathon. I'm here to tell you, we have to train hard in the Word of God to be able to share and to do those things. We've got we to gotta enter in those hard topics, and that's what we're doing tonight, and that's why we're in the book of Jude. It's not an easy book to teach, and it's not an easy book to understand as someone is teaching it to you, but it is a fight 
worth fighting. And then we're training for that. So tonight, let's look at the, the next few verses. Verse 8, 9, and 10, I'm going to read to you. The Bible says this, and remember that Jude is talking. He's told us to contend for the faith. He's also told us about these ungodly false teachers that had come in into the church. He has given us examples, three Old Testament corporate examples of what they are, what they look like, the judgment that they, that they uh, received from the Lord because of their, their false teachings. And now he, he, he begins in verse 8, and he's continued to, to describe them. He says, verse 8, Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, does not bring a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts, and those things they corrupt themselves. Jude is talking here, and he says, Look, he... He says, likewise, also these filthy dreamers. He is comparing these false teachers in his day and the false teachers that we have in our day with these ones that he has just given us three examples of. Israel was a, an example that he had given us, how the unbelieving Israel. He had also given us an example of those fallen angels and the example of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says, just like those three examples, likewise, these Filthy dreamers, these false teachers, they also defile their flesh. And he gives them, um, he gives us three examples of characteristics or ways of their apostasy and the way they have fallen away from the Lord. Number one, he says this, they defile the flesh. They defile the flesh. And also, I guess first of all, you could say they, he calls them filthy dreamers. That means that where, where do dreams originate? Anybody a doctor? Huh? Sometimes from Satan, you're right. You wake up some of them nightmares and you're in a cold sweat. But where, where, do they, where do dreams play out in your body? In your what? In your mind. When you're asleep, dreams come through your mind. He says these are filthy dreamers. What he was saying by that was that they, their minds, and he's saying the minds of these false teachers were totally corrupt. They were filthy, and all their thoughts and all their things, they, they filled them with sens um, sensational fantasy of this sensual fantasy. Listen, he, he gave them an example of Sodom and Gomorrah and those, those awful things where they filled up their sensual desires, but he, he realized that they, their minds were wrong and their minds were bad, and they had an unrealistic view uh, of the world, and all they wanted all they wanted was to fulfill their flesh. Listen, there's a lot of folks that, that today that live, claim to be Christians, but really all they're after is what their flesh wants. And they, a lot of them have fallen away uh, from that, but he says they are filthy dreamers. Number two, he says they defile the flesh. That means they were immoral. Uh, they were sensual they defiled their flesh and the example of that were Sodom and Gomorrah just through their immoral acts of immorality in their flesh the things that they've done but not also that but just bad habits that they had you know do you realize that sometimes we can develop bad habits things that will cause us to defile our flesh through those habits and he said those habits that they had developed caused them to defile their flesh. Uh, you know, the Bible talks about that in the book of Romans. I, I want to turn to you. I meant to read this to you last week uh, as we were talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. If you look in the book of Romans, chapter number 1, Paul begins to, to speak on these things, and he says this. He says that in verse 24, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies, between themselves they corrupted their bodies between themselves physically but he said also who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever and ever amen now listen can we draw an example can we draw a parallel 
from that verse to today's time. I guarantee you there are folks all over this world that are serving the creature more than the creator. It's not about what God wants, it's about what I want. It's about what makes me feel good. And if it, listen, you'll hear this. If you go out into the secular society, you'll hear this very thing. They'll say, if it feels good, do it. That's what they say. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that uh, flee youthful lusts and, and, and deny yourself those things that will lead you off into sin. But the world will tell you to do what you want to because you know why? They don't care. They don't care about you because they want you, they want you to be led off. They, care, they worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. And it says, for this cause in the book of Romans, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change their natural use into that which was against nature. So he, he's given us that example of them defiling their flesh. Not only that, but it says this, look, they despise dominion. Does anybody know what dominion means? There you go. That's exactly what it means. It's authority. They despised authority. He was saying, listen, just about every false teacher in their day, they were guilty of this. He said they despised the authority. Now, who's the supreme authority? The God and creator. Amen. He's, he is the supreme authority. He's the sovereign authority. But they despised his authority. They despised anything that ruled over them. Look what it says. They also denied the only, in verse number 4, it says, they denied the only Lord and God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They denied his authority. They denied his deity. They said, we don't believe he was really a man. Or we don't believe he was really, yeah, that's what they didn't believe. They didn't believe he was really a man. They said, well, he was some kind of spirit, but he wasn't man in the flesh. But the Bible truly teaches that God was 100% God our Jesus was 100% God and 100% man. But they despised that. They despised their men. They rejected authority. Now, the example that, that Jude gives us there was Israel, right? Who was Israel's authority? The Lord God. Who went before them? The Lord God. And he went before them in a cloud by day and, and a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And he led them. And he brought them through all different trials and tribulations that they come up to. Yet when he said, all right, it's time to enter in, they said, no, nah, we reject what you say to be true. We're going to believe what we believe. We're going to believe what these false spies or these fearful spies brought back and said. We're not going to follow you. Now, can we make a parallel to that to the day's time? You better believe it. Listen, you say, well, why is Jude relevant? It's as irrelevant as there is a book in the Bible right now. We are into a place, we come to a place in time where there is a despise, uh, people despise authority, they reject authority, they reject the, listen, first and foremost, they reject the authority of God, just like these false teachers did. But they go further than that. They say, well, we don't just reject the authority of God, but we reject any authority whatsoever. Turn on your, your, um, news each night and you'll see people running around rejecting any authority uh, they reject the authority of the police that's why they're shouting defund the police we don't want anybody to tell us you can't do that that's wrong we don't want to suffer any consequences with that uh, there's all these types of ones the the spirit that is moving in the last days is this kind of a spirit of a rejection of authority this is what i heard on one news report the other night, and I listen, I promise you, I have tried and tried not to watch too much of that. It makes me mad. How many of y'all get mad when you watch the news? I mean, I, I get ill, and I want to get in the flesh, and I want to go out there and grab some of them and just shake them and say, what are you doing? I know the Lord wouldn't be pleased with me to do that. But listen, they reject authority. But this is the word I kept hearing. So-and-so city is in anarchy. You know what anarchy means? Anarchy means the absence of authority they just do whatever you want to do there's no authority and they that's what these people want is an anarchy they live above authority to do what they want to do to fulfill their desires and to make not only that but to make themselves the authority remember what we talked about last week Robbie Zacharias what he said he says we live in a culture now where it is autonomous it's an autonomous society where it is autonomous, self-law. 
where we do whatever we want to do. That's where they want to be. Hey, listen, that's not the first time we've been there either, right? If you go back and read in your Old Testament, what does it say in the book of Judges? That day there was no king over the land of Egypt. And every man did what was right in his own eyes. And listen, can I tell you this? If we'll just go back and read a little history lesson in the book of Judges, when man does what's right in his eyes, it's usually wrong in God's eyes. This is the exact same teaching that, that Jew was experiencing here. They despised authority. They despised dominion. And listen to this, and they speak evils of dignities. What does that mean? What does the word dignities mean? I looked this up. I'll be honest with you. I didn't understand this. Yes, sir. There you go. That's exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. You're exactly right. What, for some of you listening online and may not be able to hear what Brother Edward said, he said for those that were living in the days of the judges that did what was right in their own eyes and did not want a king and rejected the king or the leadership of the king, the Lord God that was serving them, he said at the end of the book of Malachi, there's 400 years there. 400 years of absence. Not a word from God. We Look, when you turn to your, from your New Testament, or from the end of your Old Testament to New Testament, it's one turn of a page, and we think, well, that's just that's how it works. No, it was 400 years of silence right there. 400 years. Aren't you glad God's a God of mercy? Oh, man, I'm talking about, listen, that'll preach right there. After 400 years, he has spoken to us. The book, book of Hebrews said, in these days, he has spoken to us through his son. Amen. He brought his son they, from a cry for 400 years. There was not a word from heaven. But then that, that day in Bethlehem, there was a little baby cried out. Amen. And God began to speak again. And listen, he's still speaking today. He's still speaking through hearts today. Well, that's right. That's, that's all our hope, brother. That's exactly what we're hoping. But they were speak, he said also speaking evil of dignities. The word dignity... Or dignities means the state or quality of being worthy of honor or respect. Actually, those that tried to spread the gospel, brother. Absolutely. Those that tried to spread the gospel. They speak evil of those that are in a, in a, in a spot of honor, those that tried to spread the gospel, those that are in a higher dominion or a higher power. It says these false teachers spoke evil of them. They kind of spoke in pride and arrogance. They spoke as if they knew everything, and if they didn't understand everything, they just said, well, that ain't, that ain't not worth our time to even express or even learn. We don't understand it. They spoke these things, but they spoke also of those that were, that were giving the word of God. And even, look, he says this. Look what it says. The book of Jude it says, and they spoke evil of dignities. You know what that word evil right there translates? If you go look it up, that word evil translates into the Greek blasphemio. That's where we get our word blaspheme. It means to revile, to rail at, and to speak evil of, of those that should be respected. Now listen, they did this as well. I want you to do this. Turn over. You turn with me tonight on this one. Second Peter chapter number 2. Just a couple of pages over in your Bible. 2 Peter chapter number 2. You go back and read the book of 2 Peter chapter number 2, and you're going to see a very, very close um, chapter here with the book of Jude. I mean, they almost line up sometimes seems seemingly word for word. Does that mean that did Peter rip off Jude or did Jude rip off Peter? No, this was Holy Ghost inspired. Amen. Holy Ghost. It was so important that he gave it to us twice. But in the, in the chapter number 2, verse 10, it says, But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, that's talking about despising uh, dominion, presumptuous are they, self-willed, exactly what we've talked about, that they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. 
But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things which they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Now, that just that's a pretty good, uh, close verse right there. It's really close to what he was saying. But what, what is he saying? They spoke evil of these dignities. Uh, they spoke evil of those that would spread the gospel. They spoke evil of the Lord. They spoke evil of God's servants and his messengers, devil, I mean, uh, excuse me, angels. Uh, they spoke, and even those that were in high degree places of authority. Now listen, can we draw a parallel from that into the day's time? You, the answer is yes, amen. Oh, man. Woo. They are people that will get on there and spew and talk and cuss about the Lord. I mean, they'll take the Lord's name in vain. They will, they will deny that he even exists. They will do all these things. They speak evil of our dignitaries in our government. They, I mean, you turn on our, our TV and you, you listen to what they say about our president. Listen, what, whatever you believe about the president, however you feel about him, there's one thing that we all need to do, and that's respect the office. Amen? I, I thought about this uh, as I was reading this, there was a, a, a TV series that came on years and years ago about World War II called Band of Brothers. And it was very interesting, very, very good. But there's a scene in there where uh, as these men came into boot camp, they had a, a, a leader or a sergeant or a lieutenant that was over them. He was the one that whipped them into shape, made them the fighting company they were. And throughout the war, one that started down here as a private ended up working his way up. And he actually got to be above the rank of the one that, that trained him. And the one that trained him was very jealous of him, that, that boot camp leader. He was very jealous of this man. And he got to be a higher rank. And one day at the end of the war, he saw that guy. He walked by him. You know what they, you're supposed to do in the Army, right? Brother Ben can tell us he's been in the Air Force. But when you see someone that's of a higher rank, you do what? You salute, right? You salute. That guy saw him, knowed he was of a higher rank, but he hated him. He despised him. So he, and when he went to walk by him, instead of stopping to attention and, and saluting him, he just put his head down and kept walking. Well, the guy in the, in the Jeep, the one that had moved up above him, said, that's not going to go. And he said, he called his name, and he said, you salute the rank, not the man. So he made him recognize his rank. We made him recognize and respect his rank. No matter what he thought about him, he said, listen, I don't care if you hate me, but you're going to respect the rank. And in this day and time, there's certain places, certain offices that, that are in this world that we are to respect. Not, you don't have to respect that person, but you've got to respect the office. One of those things is, is those that would serve the Lord and do those things. And there was a day and time where even drunkards and even people that was that was caught up in all the filthiness of the world. They had respect for the house of God. They had respect for the things of God. They did not go out and, and speak against those. They respected it. They might not have lived it, but they respected it. And these are people that did not do that, and they still don't do that in this day and time. They do not respect the Lord. They do not respect the dignities. They do not respect anything that God has done. So, he gives us three examples of them. All right, now, number nine, verse number nine. Now we're going to get into the one I kind of gave you some homework on last week. This was one that you went, I hope you went and done some research on. <clears throat> it moves over to verse number nine. It says, yet, and listen, he's, he's coattailing here from them speaking evil of dignities, and he's giving an example of that. He says, yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not, durst not bring railing against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. Now, did anybody try to do any research on this? Did you try to look this up anywhere? Did you find a cross-reference in the Bible anywhere to this taking place? If you did, you didn't find it, did you? If you tried to look this up and cross-reference it and say, well, where else in the Bible does it talk about this great battle? that Michael, the archangel, and Satan had, you're not going to find it anymore. You know why? Because it's not there. And listen, this is one thing I thought, I, I listened to some commentaries, and I thought it was 
very good that th they said this. Jude speaks as though we sh this should be our common knowledge, right? He's thinking, hey, look, you understand this. You've heard this story before. Uh, this is not very confusing to you. But in our day and time, we read that and was like, what in the world is he talking about? I've never heard of the battle that Michael the archangel had with Satan over the body of Moses. I've never heard about that. The reason being is because it is actually this excerpt, this verse, or this, this tale is taking out of a book that is not an inspired book of the Bible. It's taken out of a book called The Assumption of Moses. It was written, it was tradition, but it was not inspired. Okay, it's not God-breathed. It was used for historical, and in the Jews' days, they used these books for historical accounts, and, and, and they read them, and they, they, they talked about things, but they're not in our Bible, they're not in our canon, because they were not God-inspired. The ones that are God-inspired, Holy Ghost-breathed, are in this book. There's others. There's one called the... The, the book of Enoch, there's one of those. We're going to talk about that a little bit later because he uses one of those. There's been great controversy about this. Does this make Jude, does this disqualify it to be able to be used in the book of the Bible because he used a book that was not, and it's not, he was just quoting it, but it was, remember what he said? He said he was compressed about by the Holy Ghost to write what he's about to write, so the Holy Ghost compressed him to use this account. But Jews acting like we're supposed to know all about this, right? But we don't. So where do we find it out? And how do we look, get some background on it? Well, first and foremost, we've got to go back. They, they're disputing about the body of Moses, right? Before we do this, let's, let's look at, at the Michael the archangel. Now, Michael is one of those angels that's named in the Bible. There's only four named angels angels in the Bible. Michael is one. We're going to talk about who? I seen what she, Gabriel. Everybody knows Gabriel, right? Gabriel was the one that came in and spoke to Mary and, and go. They have very specific jobs, right? Gabriel's job, everything that he did announced what? It was messianic. He announced the, the coming of Jesus. He announced everything that he'd done. It was to call, to bring Jesus about. He had a messianic work, or that's what he was called to do, to uh, work in the, the things of the Messiah. Michael is the other, Arch Michael the archangel, his job was to watch after and defend Israel, to watch after and defend Israel. Now, he's defending the body of Moses. Who was Moses? Moses was a Jew, right? He was Israel. He was the leader of the Israelites as they came out. This was, let, just let me read you some background. The meaning of his name is who is like God. So Michael was who is like God. He, he has very different titles. He's talked about here. He's called an archangel here. And you'll hear sometimes somebody say the archangels. It's not plural. There's just one, Michael. He's the only archangel. And it's also, he was a great prince. Talked about that in Daniel and a chief prince in Daniel as well. <coughs> But this is the activities that he has. That he'll stand up for Israel during the tribulation time. If you go back and look in the book of Daniel and read in there in chapter 12, it talks about him, one of his jobs during the tribulation is he'll stand up for Israel. He argues with Satan over the body of Moses. We're about to look right into that. But he also fights against Satan in the heavens in Revelation chapter 12. He fights, but he's defending Israel. That's his job. All right. He's defending and contending with the devil about the body of Moses. Let's, let's go back really quick to the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy, do you remember what we talked about Moses last week? I think we talked about last week. Moses did not get to lead the children of Israel into the promised land, right? Who did that? Joshua, that's right. Moses messed up. I mean, y'all can say we all mess up. I, I'm not saying Moses only messed up one time, but he messed up right here one time, and it cost him the promised land. Be careful and not just make our mistakes so nonchalant. Sometimes we say, oh, we all mess up. We all. Hey, Moses got upset, and just in a moment of, of in the flesh, cost him a lot of things. It cost him moving into the promised land. Remember, he, 
He told him to strike the rock the first time. The second time, told him to speak to the rock. And instead of speaking to it, he smote the rock twice. Yeah, right. So he just, he, he did not get to enter in. So we go to the, the Bible in the book of Deuteronomy. And in the beginning of the book of Deuteronomy, he's talking to the Lord here. The book of, uh, excuse me, Moses is. And this is what he says in verse 24 and 20 through 29. It says, O Lord God, thou hast begun to show thy servant thy greatness and thy mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or in earth that can do according to thy works and according to thy might? I pray thee, let me go over, see the good land that is beyond Jordan, that goodly mountain in Lebanon. But the Lord was wroth with me for your sakes and would not hear me. And the Lord said unto me, Let it suffice thee, speak no more unto me of this matter. Get thee up into the top of Pisgah, and lift up thine eyes westward, and northward, and southward, and eastward, and behold it with thine eyes, for thou shalt not go over this Jordan. That's what Moses said. He's like, Lord, boy, I've done a lot for you. I went and got them old hard-headed Israelites. I brought them out of Egypt. I listened to their complaining everywhere we went. I've done all these things, and Lord, we're almost there. We're almost there. I surely want to go over into that promised land. This is, what, this is what God said. He said, no. Nah. He said, you get up there on Mount Pisgah and you look at it. He said, I'm going to let you see it, but you can't enter in it. Sometimes, boy, we, we, we will let our sin in our lives and it will cause us from getting to the places where Amen. God wants us to be. Listen to me today. If we're not careful, we'll just throw off our sin and say, well, it's all right, but it will keep us from getting where God wants us to be. You know where God wanted Moses to be? In the promised land. That's where he wanted him. That's what he designed. But because Moses sinned, he could not get in to the promised land. God said, don't even bring it up anymore, Moses. It's done. It's a done deal. You're not getting in. So he, he, he allowed him. You say, well, that's kind of harsh, God, that you would not let Moses go in. Well, it, it was God is just. Let's say that. God is just in all that he does. So in verse, if you skip over to Deuteronomy chapter 34, it says this, And Moses went up from the plains of Moab unto the mountain of Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, that is over against Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan, and all of Naphtali, and all the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah, unto the utmost sea, and the south, and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, unto Zoar, and the Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. Verse 5 says, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab over against Beth Peor, but no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. Now, it says he buried him. Who's he? There you go. God buried him. It wasn't Joshua. It wasn't, one, it wasn't Aaron. It wasn't one of the children of Israel. It says he buried him. Same thing, I, one of the commentaries I heard, I, I, I listened to and I thought was pretty good. He says this, God does this a lot of times. You ever thought about when Noah got in the boat? Who closed the door? Who closed the door when Noah got in the boat? God did. He had to. So he buried him. The Bible says that God took Moses and he buried him, but it says no man knoweth of his sepulcher even unto this day. It says nobody even knows where he's buried even unto this day. Why would they not? How come he's not <laughs> I, You got me there, brother. I don't know. I hadn't seen that. But he is God. But it says he not even know where he's where he, where his sepulchre's at or where he's buried at. Why would they, why would God not want the people of Israel to know where Moses was buried? There you go. They might dig him up. But instead of digging him up, they might not dig him up, but they might do what? They might go down and worship where he was at. Listen, Moses was very as, even as much as trouble as they gave Moses, they loved Moses and they respected Moses and God said if, I, if he knows where they're 
where they're where his grave is, they might even worship him. And the reason why he says that is because, do you remember that brass serpent that he had that he built in the wilderness and they was getting bitten by all those snakes and they, he said, look up to this brass serpent on the pole and he said, once you look up, it'll be, you'll be healed just as a, a catalyst or as a parallel to Jesus being lifted up on the cross. They, later on down, 600 and something years later, they were taking that brass serpent and they were worshiping him as an idol. And King Hezekiah had to break it into pieces and, and get it out of the house because they were worshiping it. God said, I don't want them to worship the body of Moses. So, they, nobody knew where he was buried. And do you know what one of Michael's jobs was? To defend it. That's right, to defend it. Because there's somebody else that wanted his body. Who else? That's right. The, the Satan wanted his body. He wanted to go get where his body was. He wanted to get him. He wanted to do away with him. Why would Satan want his body? Well, first and foremost, there's two thoughts here. First and foremost, he wanted him so he could give him to the Israelites. Say, hey, here's Moses' body. You put him where you want to. Make an idol out of him so you'll worship him and not God. Listen, God, Satan is always trying to get us to worship something other than God. He said, I'll take that. The other thought is this. That Moses' job is not over yet. Moses' job's not done. His ministry is not through. You say, well, what do you mean? He let them all out. Yeah, but he didn't go into the promised land, but he's got another job. What's his job? We've got to go to the book of Revelation for this. Let's go to Revelation chapter number 11 really, really quick. i got about nine minutes and we're going to be done. The book of Revelation chapter number 11 talks about these, the prophecy of these two witnesses in the end times and when the tribulation, after we're gone out of here in those, the end times, the tribulation comes upon this earth, there's going to be two witnesses that come back that, that stand and to preach and they, 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 they do all these things. And it says this in verse 5, and it said, If any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt, him, hurt them, he must be in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of the prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Now listen, these two witnesses are going to come. They're going to witness to Israel. They're going to call out and tell them all these things. And Satan's going to eventually kill them. Or, but listen, this is what's going to happen. Who are the two witnesses? Who are? You go do some research on your own. You'll find out all different people think of different ones. But listen, he gives, gives us some clues to who they are. Four different things that they are able to do. Number one, it says they are able to bring fire proceeds out of their mouth. Or they were able to call down fire from heaven. Do you know of a person in the Bible that was able to pray out and call down fire from heaven? There you go. The prophet Elijah. You remember over there on Mount Carmel? When he had that battle with all of Balaam's uh, prophets and he called out and prayed unto heaven and he sent fire down from heaven. That's one thing. He says that person, one of those witnesses, will have the power to do that. It also says this, they will have the power to shut heaven that it, it rained not in those days. Do you know of another person or somebody in the Bible that prayed and it didn't rain for three and a half years? Do you know who that was? That was also Elijah, right? James chapter number 5 verse talks about that. It says that... Je that Elijah prayed, and for three and a half years, there was no rain on this earth. And that's pretty important, that three and a half years. It kind of ties together with there's going to be two sets of the tribulation, three and a half years, and then three and a half years, he's going to pray. So listen, one of the prophets we've established, or one of the witnesses is who? Elijah. Because he can bring fire down and shut heaven up from rain. But it says, this is the next two. He says, and he have the power over waters... To turn them to blood. Do you know of anybody in the Bible that might have turned some waters into blood? Y'all remember that anywhere? Go way back into Exodus. You remember when, old, when God's people was in Egypt and God said he called a man named Moses. He said, Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. He said he went and done those things. And when Pharaoh said no, it said Moses went out. And with that rod, what did he do? He made the water into blood. I'm talking about the, the, the river turned to blood. It didn't look like blood. It was blood. Amen. 
Not only was the river turned to blood, but also the fountains and the wells and every, every bit of water that was in that place was turned to blood. Well, one of the characteristics that they would have power over to turn the waters into blood. And also, and to smite the earth with all plagues as it is written, as often as they will. Now, <clears throat> when Pharaoh said, I'm not going to let your people go, what did he do? He continued to go and bring plagues. God used him and brought plagues upon that earth, ten plagues, until he let his people go. So I believe, don't take my word for it. You go back and study it out because there's others that will disagree with this sometimes. They'll, they'll say it's somebody else. But I believe the two witnesses are going to be Elijah and Moses. Moses is coming back. Do you know why Satan would not want, Moses, would want the body of Moses to do away with him so he couldn't come back, so he couldn't fulfill that last prophecy, so he could not fulfill his final job into doing that. All right, I said all that to say this, to establish it. This is the, the battle that Michael and Satan fought to keep Moses' body. It was a battle. They fought it. Michael contended with the devil. And as Michael contended with the devil, Jude is using this for an for an observation for us, and he says, listen, even though Michael was fighting with Satan for the body of Moses, even during the fight, Michael understood the place of Satan. Even though it was Satan, he recognized his authority. And he said he would not even bring a railing accusation against the devil. Now, who, if there's one person in this world you, you think God would be all right with us giving it just us chewing out, how many of y'all know how to chew somebody out? Miss Ann sitting back here. I know she knows how to chew somebody out. She's getting pointed at back there, amen? Some of y'all is good at chewing out. But listen, if it was all right to chew anybody out, don't you think God would be all right with us chewing the devil out? I mean, we could just give him all we got, and sometimes we do. But listen, we better be careful. Because the Bible says here that we need to respect, even, even though he's the devil, He's got authority over this earth. And it said, Michael would not even chew him out and would not bring a railing accusation against the devil. Even though he could have and even though he probably wanted to, he said, I'm not going to do it because, listen, I respect your authority. Even the authority that you have, I respect it. So he didn't do it, but he said what? The Lord, the Lord rebuked thee. You know how we can rebuke the devil? Submit to God. But so many times we try to rebuke him. We try to, to bring an accusation. We try to get thee behind me and we just chew the devil out. And that's all right. But listen, we don't have the power to do anything to Satan in our, of ourselves. But who does have the power? The Bible says the Lord has all power. He can come. And listen, if we'll just fall down and say, Lord, I'm the devil's on my back today and I need you to rebuke him. I need you to bind him. I need you to get him off my case. I'm here to tell you the Lord has the power to do that. You can sit there, sit there and yell and scream and, and cuss even if you want to till you blew in the face at the devil. But listen, you don't have the power to do that. But God does. And he said, this is what Michael said. He says, the Lord rebuked thee, devil. And when the Lord rebuked him. So what he's saying is, these false teachers would just bring these railing accusations at all of these people. Because they thought they were mightier than all they was. What they didn't realize is they had no power at all. The only power they had was the power to lead people astray. That is the whole point that Jude was trying to make here, that he, we need to be careful about bringing these accusations respecting authority. Listen, those of us that truly want to follow the Lord, the Bible tells us and it instructs us to respect all those in authority. Listen, if there's some young people watching tonight, there's some young people here. You need to respect authority. You need to respect the authority of the uh, of those that are in authority over you. I'm talking about on the on the government level. You ought to respect the authority of your mama and daddy. Young people, y'all listen to me tonight. You need to respect your parents. The Bible says if you'll honor your parents and, and, and honor them, you'll make your days long upon the earth. That begins with respecting. Listen, for us adults, that means we as well, not just children. 
but we ought to also respect the authorities that are above us and recognize them and honor them when honor is due and respect them. It's a good witness of the Lord. Because when we don't do that, when we don't respect that, it's showing that we don't have respect for any kind of authority. So if when we don't respect the authority that is over our physical lives, a lost person will look at us and say, well, they probably don't have no respect for the authority of God in their life. So we need to make sure that we're making the good example. I'm done. It's 8 o'clock, but really quick. Let me go verse number 10. I'm going to get it. Amen. Really quick. But these things speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts and those things they corrupt themselves. What, he's, what Jude is, is comparing them to here is brute beasts. Animals, pretty much. How do animals respond? What drives an animal? Do they have feelings? There you go, instinct. That's exactly right. An animal is driven by instinct. That means he has an instinct when his, bite, when his belly gets hungry, he starts hunting food. When he wants something to eat or when he needs to have a cool place to lay down, he starts hunting shade. And he is only driven by his instinct. He is only driven by what can satisfy his hunger or his, whatever he needs. He is driven by that. He says we need to be careful because those false teachers are only driven by what they want. Listen. I heard it said this way this week. I was reading on this. Somebody says they were only worried about feeding themselves. Animals were only worried about feeding themselves. These false teachers are only worried about feeding themselves. What's the Bible say about the good shepherd? The good shepherd cares for his sheep, right? What does he want to do? He wants to care and he wants to feed his sheep. He has put good men of God in this, in, in this world uh, over churches. He has made them the under-shepherd. And I can promise you there's some men of God in this, in this, in this county and the surrounding communities that all they care about is not feeding themselves but feeding their sheep, instructing them, encouraging them, giving them what they stand in need of spiritually. That's what they're looking for. But you can guarantee you, you know how you can spot out a false prophet. So he's not worried about nobody but him. Whatever he wants is what he gets. That's how you spot one. But you can get one those folks that, that love their, their flock, love their sheep. And I promise you, you can, you can see them all over this community. Uh, I'm talking about in the surrounding areas through these churches. There's some men of God, man, and all they want to do is, is feed their sheep. You know how I know that? Because in order for a shepherd or an under-shepherd to feed the sheep, He's got to first eat. He's got to first study. He's got to first have the Lord feed him. Listen, I can't give you anything until he gives me something. And if, I don't, if he don't feed me, I can't feed you. I can't share anything with you. But listen, these men of God that, that care and will lead you down the right way, I promise you, you can find them searching the scriptures daily. Searching the scriptures. Trying to find that feed for their sheep in order to grow them. Jude says this, watch out for them that don't care nothing but about themselves because they're false teachers. I hope that was interesting to you tonight, uh, about, especially about Moses. That was just something that, that we don't get into a whole lot. You go up and try to look up somebody that's preached a message on that, and you can't find one, I promise you. I, I, I tried, amen. I wanted to see what somebody else had to say on the subject. You can't find a whole lot about it. Because it's just one of those subjects that nobody talks about. I hope you've learned something that you didn't know before. I pray that it helps you as you walk. I pray that it encourages you to be a, a better witness for God and to do what God wants you to do and have the respect where we have to, to be. Next week we're going to be on these next uh, few verses. He's going to talk about some individual examples now. We're moving really fast now. We're going to pick up the speed a little bit. We're going to move really fast and get to the end and Jude is going to talk to you and I about how we can strengthen ourselves to contend for the faith in these last days. Uh, anybody got anything they want to add tonight? Amen. If not, if it's been good to be in the Lord's house tonight, say amen.
Amen. God is good and all the time. God is good. I mess that up every time. God is good all the time. And all the time. There you go. It's good. He is fantastic. And uh, I can't wait to you to learn all the things that God's been doing. But, man, he's been good. And uh, let's just give him honor. Let's stand our feet tonight. We're going to be dismissed. And uh, pray that God would watch over you through the rest of the week. God would help you. And uh, God would grow us. Invite somebody to come back to church with you on Sunday, and we'll see what God has for us today. Brother Ben, would you dismiss us tonight? Amen.